Good morning and God bless you. How in the world are you today? My name is Bishop Michael A. Clayton, Senior of the Gospel Spreading Church, and I also serve as the pastor 
of the Philadelphia Church of God. So how are you, family of God? All right. It's wonderful to know that we are in the family of God and that we belong to Jesus and he belongs to us. As a songwriter wrote, now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not just for the years of time alone, but for eternity. So we have a wonderful, wonderful reason to praise God. So my soul says, hallelujah. And I encourage you to rejoice with me. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. And as a matter of fact, the Bible encourages us to rejoice. The Bible tells us that praise is comely for the upright. And we're gonna be talking about worship today. So we might as well praise the Lord right now for a few minutes. Can you just raise your hand and say, hallelujah, 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 amen. Can you say, bless that wonderful name of Jesus, hallelujah. Can you say, we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, amen. Worthy is the lamb which was slain, but now is alive forevermore to receive honor and glory and riches forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I didn't hear you, but God hears you because that's who the worship is going to. All right, God. And we're still getting used to our virt virtual worship services, but you know what? It's just good that we have this medium to congregate together. Amen. God is so good. So I'm very happy to have this uh, opportunity to speak with you today and to minister with you and to be with you and fellowship with you on this uh, medium that we have, the virtual medium. So uh, we have a lot to pray about, don't we? So let's bring, spend some time praying and going to the Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us this great opportunity to come into your presence one more time. You are our faithful Father God. You are our omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, Father God. You are wonderful, you are good. Your name is excellent. You are a majestic God. There is no other God besides you. We lift your name high above the earth. Heaven and earth are full of you. Heaven and earth are praising you. And I say along with the psalmist, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. So Heavenly Father, we come to you just looking to hear a word from you today. We're asking you, Heavenly Father, to fill our empty vessels, Heavenly Father, fill them up to the top. We wanna hear from you, we wanna hear and receive some spiritual manna from on high. Because we know, as Jesus said, quoted from the Old Testament, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we say, feed us, Lord, feed us, feed us, feed us from your word. I'm asking you, Lord, to move by your spirit. And I'm saying, spirit of the living God, just fall afresh on me, take control of me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. I want to just be your instrument today, Heavenly Father. I just want to open my mouth and you fill my mouth with your words and you fill my mouth with your uh, by your spirit that I might say and do what is pleasing in your sight. I'm asking, Lord, that you might send your spirit forth to uh, speak to the hearts of all of the listeners and all of the watchers right now and later. I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that you might uh, speak life into us and build us up in your spirit. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name, just thanking you for the fullness of your spirit right now as I take off the reins and get off the uh, throne of my life. You take over, Jesus. I ask this in your name of first sake. Amen, amen, amen. So today, in our message a few weeks ago, I think it was a few weeks ago, we worked through the topic, what will it be like to be in God's presence eternally? This week, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we will delve into the topic, what about children and worship in heaven? What about children and worship in heaven? 
okay? This is eschatology, the doctrine of uh, the last things. I'm trusting God and trusting his Holy Spirit to use me to give you a deeper uh, understanding about heaven. And you might ask the question, why focus on heaven? Uh, basically, because heaven is going to be our eternal home. And during my devotions, I believe it was on Friday, uh, I was uh, going through a devotion on uh, a Bible.com, and it was uh, a devotion written by Dr. Charles Stanley. And I enjoy anything that he writes and anything that he preaches. He's just a, a man who is rooted and grounded in the word of God, a pastor indeed a Bible teacher indeed. And uh, this devotion, the topic was passion and purpose, Find, having, uh, finding your purpose in, in, uh, in uh, the family of God, your purpose for your life and having passion around it. And he was talking about heaven uh, in one of the sessions. And I'm gonna read exactly what he wrote, which really excited me because the way he says it is so uh, it's so enlightening and so encouraging. He said, and I quote, you have absolutely no concept of how fantastic heaven is. You may think you know, but anything you know is only a small fraction, if even that, of the way it really is. You have no concept of what it's gonna be like to live in the near presence of God and to have eternity to do all he might ask of you to do. As a person with a finite mind and body, you can't begin to fathom what it'll be like to live forever in an unlimited body and mind. That's true. You may have experienced great love here on this earth, but it's nothing compared to the death of love you're going to experience in heaven. The same is true for joy, fulfillment, and every other good thing that you can imagine. Oh, don't you want to go there? I'm going there. I have a reservation there, don't you? Get your reservation. Hallelujah. Our gracious Father God has carried us through another turbulent and unsettling week. The coronavirus pandemic is out of control. It is spiking and almost every country on the planet is growing uh, rapidly. Some countries are handling the spike better than others. Unfortunately, our country is not one of them. Simply stated, man cannot control COVID-19, the plague that is upon this world. And there are several reasons why man cannot control COVID-19. One reason is sinful pride and arrogance. We just think that we know and what we do is uh, what we can do and our plans are the right plans and arrogance of uh, when we make mistakes, not wanting to admit them. Another reason is there's a lack of love and uh, for others and selfishness. And that might be grounded in the fact of who uh, people feel might be the ones who are getting the brunt of uh, and disproportionately uh, suffering from uh, COVID-19. Uh, more infections uh, uh, for the uh, black and brown community and more deaths in this community. And maybe some people think that, well, it's not gonna affect us. I, I may get sick, but I'll get better. Didn't you hear somebody say that this week? If you get sick, you'll get better not the truth. Uh, uh, another reason is poor, poor leadership at the top. Another leader, another reason is uh, false information. Another reason is no desire or will to focus on the management of the coronavirus pandemic for the safety of people. So there's several reasons why uh, this is uh, out of control. But the most important reason is I, I believe our Father God is making it clear that no one can control the coronavirus pandemic except him. And mankind must humble ourselves before God 
and ask for his forgiveness, seek his face and ask for his help. Second Chronicles 714 speaks to that. It says, if my people, and this is talking about the people of God now, the onus is on us, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So the onus is on us. We have to humble ourselves and pray and, and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways as people of God. And God will hear our prayers and heal our land. So we need to be thinking about our responsibility uh, as people of God to seek his face and partner with him in terms of the coronavirus. Maybe you didn't think about it that way. I have been. Also, we must be determined to exercise our franchise on November 3rd, 2020. As a matter of fact, many of us have already voted. I have, very happy to have done it. And uh, the polls are open. Some of you are gonna vote maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. But it's very important for you to exercise your franchise. Too many of our ancestors have shed their blood for us to have this right. And I believe that this is the most important election in our lifetime, certainly as far as I can see. But we can't forget about God, all right? God is sovereign. Although we may not be seeing him and uh, uh, what he's doing, but he's actively working for his glory and on our behalf, even during this time of crisis. Let's look at Romans 8, 31 to 32. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Look what this says, it's talking about God's everlasting love for us. And it asks questions, actually three questions. It says, what then shall we say to these things? What can we say about going through the times that we're going through right now? Second question, if God be for us, who can be against us? Can we say that? And I say, yes, we can. Then it says, he who did not spare his own son, but, he, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Three questions, three answers. God's everlasting love for us. So we're in God's love and we're in his care and we're in his capable hands right now. God hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't left us to fend for ourselves. He's not asleep. The Bible tells us he doesn't sleep or slumber. He sees the weakness and sin. He sees the havoc that the coronavirus has taken place in this, in this world. He said that judgment of wicked people is coming quickly. So don't worry about it, trust God. Now, it's important for us to know how to pray and what to pray about as we look at the latest numbers of the coronavirus pandemic on our globe and in our country. And it's also important to remember that our country has 4% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the coronavirus cases. How many cases do we have on the globe? And this is uh, information that I got from the John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. Global cases, 42 million. 738,662. How many global deaths? 1,151,056 deaths. What about in the good old USA? How many cases? And the last time we spoke about it, this was, looks like it was a, uh, almost 2 million cases more than the last time. In the USA, 8 million. 578,175 cases. And as far as U.S. deaths, 224,906 deaths. Uh, I saw on MSNBC this morning, they say it's uh, 226,000 uh, plus deaths. And the world meter says that there's uh, about 230,085 deaths. So you see it's rampant. This uh, coronavirus uh, is a plague of historical 
proportions, it's a one in a century, uh, once in a century uh, health crisis. And according to the Health Metrics and Evaluation Center at the University of Washington, they're projecting that the U U.S. will top more than 385,611 COVID deaths by February 1st, 2021. It's staggering and appalling news. And again, as I say to you, you have to look at each one of those numbers, not as a number, but as a person and as a uh, family that is losing, that have lost a loved one, and that has family members that are suffering. And there's nothing that they can do about it. They can't even go and visit them. It's a shame. And it's appalling. And we have to partner with God in prayer during the coronavirus pandemic. Remember Second Chronicles 714, if my people, he's telling us to call on him, humble ourselves, pray, seek his face. God is sovereign. Jesus Christ is sovereign over everything that's happening in our country and the world. And that includes the coronavirus pandemic. He knows the beginning and the end, and he will take us safely through it. Now let's get into God's word. All right. We're going to go to our text, which is found in Revelations chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Our context is found in Revelation 4, chapter 1 through 11. What about children and worship in heaven? Revelation 7, 11 and 12. It reads like this. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Blessing and honor, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. So what about the children? What happens to babies and young children when they die? This question has been asked by many parents who seek comfort when their baby or child dies. And just to get a picture of the answer, we look in the word of God. And the answer to this question can be found in understanding and in believing in the character of God. Psalm 86, 15 says this about God's character. It says, but you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. What does the word of God tell us about himself and children? I believe that the Bible impl implies, and I believe it really says that life and personhood begins at conception. I really believe that. This means to me, that any persons conceived but not born are persons, regardless as to if they were taken to heaven when they die from miscarriages or even abortions. Look at these scriptures. David describes God's plan for him before he was born. Let's look at Psalm 139, 13 through 16. This is what David says. He says, you formed my inward parts. You covered me from my mother's womb. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, yet your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Wow, think about it. 
And in your book, they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet, there were none of them. Think about that. The psalmist says, Selah, pause and reflect. The Bible also talks about this and illustrates this in the calling of Jeremiah as a prophet. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter one, verse, verse five. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Let's look at the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. This is Jesus speaking to uh, uh, Saint, uh, uh, John was speaking to uh, John the Baptist in Luke 1, 15. And let me get that for you. All right, Luke 1, 15. Give me a second, I can find it. This is the angel talking to uh, Joseph, the stepfather uh, father of Jesus Christ, and it says, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Oh, this is talking about, I'm sorry. This is about John the Baptist and his parents. So please forgive me. I misspoke and miswrote. And it says, uh, let, let me uh, start with verse 13. And the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Okay, that's where I was getting at. All right. And the word of God tells us in the Gospels, and we'll use St. Mark uh, as an example. I'm not going to read this, but St. Mark 10, 13 to 14 talks about how Jesus loved children and blessed children. And he kind of uh, corrected the disciples when they wouldn't let the children come to him. He said, don't forbid these children to come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. Now, I have a personal reason for uh looking at children and what about the children and i want to share it with you i don't think i shared this to many people but my late wife cynthia and, and myself we were told before uh we had any children that we couldn't have any and that's what we were told but God was gracious to us. Uh, Mike and Kevin are bookends, okay? On one side is Michael, on the other side is Kevin, all right? Thinking about Mike and Kevin. Mike came out and he was all, all always a, a little grown man. <laughs> little Mike, always grown, always in conversations and very articulate as a child. And Kevin was the other bookend. And I'll never forget uh, when Kevin was born and uh, the uh, nurse handed him to me uh, and I held him right after he was born. I sang a song that I sang to Mike first and I was singing it to Kevin. And it's really about daddy loves his little boy. and. When I start singing, Kevin starts singing and cooing. When that's something, Kevin's name means kind-hearted Christ bearer. And his character is like that as well. So Mike, Mike is like a son of God and 
and uh, Kevin is a Christ bearer, kind-hearted Christ bearer. But in between Mike and Kevin, that's why I said they were bookends, we had four miscarriages. And I'll never forget one of them. I think it was the third miscarriage. Uh, and I think this was the one that we, my mother, my wife was able to hold in a womb the longest. Uh, we had to go, we lived in uh, uh, Winfield at uh, that time, and we had to go to the Northwest uh, section of the city to the hospital that I took her to when she had the miscarriage. And I'll never forget coming home from the hospital uh, and I was stopped by a policeman and he said I ran a stop sign, which I really knew in my heart I didn't, but I remember saying to him, uh, oh, please forgive me. Uh, if I ran a stop sign, I didn't mean to, I thought I did, but my wife just had a miscarriage and I'm upset and I'm on my, I'm on my way home. It was in the middle of the night, early hours of the morning. And he said, okay, I'm gonna let you go this time. But I don't forget how he was kind of rough and gruff with me, but it didn't matter. But I always wondered and put it in the back of my mind about the children that we lost. Uh, through miscarriages, but you know, I had to put a happy face on and to comfort my wife when I went to see her. So I never thought about it or never really brought it up much. And then um, I saw this um, um, movie, this DVD, and I want to tell you about it in case you'd like to read it. It's called Heaven Is, in case you'd like to rent it or buy it, it's called Heaven Is For Real. Heaven Is For Real. And it's about a, a father who recounts a true story of his of the near death of his son, and how his son, while he was uh, between death and uh, life, he visited heaven. It's a very powerful story, and some of the things that he said, and some of the things that I learned in in, in this, he talked about a sister that he had that he never had and the parents had never even mentioned to him that they had a miscarriage of sister and he talked about how he went when he when he when the child uh his uh went to heaven a, a young a young girl grabbed him by the hand and and said i'm your sister and that really started me to think about it okay that's my story all right it's bringing back memories one of the things that is talked about when we talk about children in heaven, we think about something that's called the age of accountability. And um, according to gotquestions.org, this is the definition for the concept of the age of uh, accountability. Uh, the age, the concept of age of accountability is that children are not held accountable by God for their sins until they reach a certain age. And if that child dies before reaching the age of accountability, that child will, by the grace and mercy of God, be granted entrance into heaven. And the Bible even talks about children playing around in, in uh, uh, the, new, the new earth uh, with uh, uh, snakes and wild beasts. Uh, now, the Bible does not give an age when this happens. This is the age in which a child has the ability to choose evil or to choose good. Now, one thing that you can recognize as children are growing up, even as toddlers, you can see that they have a sin nature and they're trying to learn the difference between them. And as an educator, I can tell you that no two children develop in the same rate, in the same way. They just don't. One of the things that we often talk about in education is ages and stages, all right? They are, the children are different and on different developmental uh, paths. Historically, the Jews have chosen age 13 
as the age of accountability. And that's when they had their Abat mitzvahs and their Bath mitzvahs. And we even see that uh, in the life of Jesus and how uh, he was taken to uh, the temple at the age 13 and offerings were made for him, all right? But the important point that I wanna make is Christian parents must dedicate themselves to the task of staying sensitive to their children and leading them to Christ as soon as they're able to understand their need to be saved. This is the parents' responsibility. Some people leave it for the church or the Sunday school teacher. What are you gonna do now uh, that you can't come to church, okay? What are you gonna do now when you can't bring them to Sunday school? It's your responsibility to do that, all right? And you're supposed to lead them to Christ. This is your, your job, your task. And living the Christian life before your children is therefore uh, of, of vital importance. So, I mean, I was doing a lot of research on this and <laughs> reading a lot of things by different Bible scholars about heaven and ages in heaven, where the children remain children, where they be a certain age. And one uh, Bible scholar whose name you would, you would recognize, I mentioned it, was talking about the everybody in heaven will be about age 30. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I relish in the point of, of being 30 again <laughs> for the rest of my life. 30 was, I think that was a very good year. Okay. But the point is that God loves children and God will make sure that children who are die at the early age and, and uh, by miscarriages, even uh, by abortions, whatever, as children, uh, and they haven't reached the age of accountability, they will be saved and there will be children and young people in heaven. I believe that. Okay. But what about worship in heaven? All right. We read Revelation 7, verses 11 and 12. And I'll read it again. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worship, saying, Amen. Blessed, blessing in glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God. Amen, amen, amen. Forever and ever and ever. Praise the Lord. All right, now we're gonna to go to our context, which is, and we're gonna take a little more time in this. Let's turn to, and this is the first time we really see worship totally in the book of Revelation. And this is the throne room of, of heaven. And it's found in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to read that to you. And as I said before, this is a New King James Version. And it reads like this. After these things, I looked. This is John, uh, uh, John Apostle speaking. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. He said, immediately I was in the spirit. That reminds me of what we've been studying uh, on, on Friday night, well, Thursday night in our Bible study. I was in the spirit about worship and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on a throne and he who sat on the throne was like Jasper. It's like a clear gold and a, and a Saudi stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne, around the throne, there were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. 
and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I just want to point out in verse four, it talks about uh, around the throne with a 24 thrones, and on the thrones were the 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. These 24 uh, elders sitting on the throne represents the uh, redeemed and raptured church, okay? The white robes, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of the saints. And they had on a, they had crowns of gold in their hands, crowns that they earned from their works that they did for the Lord after they were uh, saved, all right? At the judgment seat of Christ. And that's something. So we, we gain all of this and, and learning about these things as we study the word of God. All right, verse five. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal, okay? And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. These are the cherubim. These are the angels that uh, 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 they have a, a job of uh, always being in the presence of God and worshiping back and forth. These are the angels that, well, I'm going to tell you what they said later on. And they were angels of rank. All right. And you have to understand that angels were created being are created beings and their numbers are innumerable all right the first living creature was like a lion the second living creature was like a calf the third living creature had a face like a man and a fourth living creature was like a flying eagle all right there is some reference to that don't have time to go into it right now but the four living creatures each had six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day and night. And what are they saying? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, whenever they give glory, the four the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created. So this is constantly is going around, going on in heaven. The uh, author of the book, uh, heaven his name is randy alcorn and he said this and it made an impact on me he said most people are aware that we will worship god in heaven however most people don't understand how thrilling it would be and this is me saying think about it think about it he said we will gather to sing praise to god for his greatness, wisdom, power, grace, and mighty work of redemption, hallelujah. Overwhelmed by his magnificence, we will fall on our faces in unrestrained happiness and say, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, amen. Now, what will we be like? We will have new resurrected, powerful, eternal, imperishable, immortal, indestructible bodies and infinite minds so that we can worship God throughout eternity with praise that is due him. All right, and let me tell you something about our praise. Our praise will not be boring or rote, you know, just mechanical, oh no. We will not get tired of praising God. We will be enjoying his magnificent glory and holiness every moment that we are in his presence. There will always be something new and exciting and excellent about God for us to experience every moment we're in his glory. We will forever be learning about him and his majesty and person. We will be in awe of, his, of him and praise him throughout all eternity. We will truly 
be worshiping the Lord and we will enjoy our worship. Hallelujah. Now, Dr. Jeremiah is another person who I admire. He wrote a lot uh, and writes a lot about the end time. And he shared four things that we can learn from John's experience on the Isle of Patmos. And I wanna share these four things with you uh, because I like the way that he uh, phrased them, all right? First of all, the first thing that he shared about worship, and this, th these are his words, worship is not about us, it's about him. You need to jot that down. Worship is not about us, it's about him. We learn that by looking at worship in Revelation. God is the center of our worship. It's not about our music. It's not about our singing. It's not about the place of our worship. You know, sometimes people will say, I enjoy church today. I got my praise on. It's not about that. It's not about you. All right. It's only about God. It's about worshiping God. And listen to this uh, Thursday night Bible study, people. It's about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And we can see that as we read about worship in heaven and revelation. The second statement that he made was, worship is not about here, it's about there. I like that. Worship is not about here, it's about there. Think about it. When we worship God, it is not so much about our experience or making us feel better, okay? It's not all about that. Even though we feel better, okay, it's not about that. It's about focusing on God and where he is and where he is. It's about worshiping his majesty and glory in his everlasting kingdom. We have a church constitution, Colossians 3, uh, the whole chapter, but verse 1 to 4 talks about the fact that uh, since we've been risen with Christ, we should seek things that are above and not things on earth. All right. It says that we are fo focused on things that are above, set our affections on things that are above. Remember, we are citizens of heaven. We are foreigners and strangers passing through this world. We are to be worshiping God and worshiping him with the forethought of where he is and longing to be where he is. OK. The third thing that he said is worship is not about now. It's about then. Worship is not about now, it's about then. All right? I couldn't have put it in better terminology, but it makes me think. Worship is not focusing on what we're going through now in our hard times. <laughs> My mother taught me a song when I was a child. I had a hard time, but I got over. Okay? having hard times each day, having hard trials and tribulations. Okay, we can make this journey if the Lord holds our hand. Worship is looking forward to the glory we will receive when we what? Complete our race, which we have run with purpose. That's what worship is all about. The glory which we will receive. Looking unto Jesus, all right? He had pleasure in the fact that he was obedient to God and he finished the race. He did what God told him to do the way God told him to do it. That's what we should be uh, excited about. It's not about now, it's about then. And finally, worship is not about one, it's about many. Worship is not about one, it's about many. Let me tell you something. Corporate worship in heaven is going to be so awesome. Think about it. Corporate worship right now should be awesome. And it has been awesome. Although we were saved individually, and we are, but once we were saved, we were baptized into the body of Christ. Amen? And we will remain together throughout all eternity. So it is imperative that we worship the Lord together as his body, the church. Amen? So how do we prepare for eternity in heaven? Some of our favorite verses, St. John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. 
and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, what's the onus on us? And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. That's why we have to lean in uh, to our service, serving God with all we have. We have work to do, saints. Let's get busy. We need to be uh, uh, experiencing and and uh, being involved in our jumpstart ideas. I haven't received very many from men. Men, I know that you are serving God. I know that you're experiencing uh, 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 someone who has encouraged you. We need to write about it so and share it with the saints. Uh, the Bible tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 that we need to think of ways that we can stimulate one another to love and good work. We have work to do. We just can't be sitting around now. Jesus is soon to come. Church, let's get to work. We know that the rapture is imminent. He could come at any time. Therefore, we ought to be watching and praying and working and waiting and working when Jesus comes, living holy lives. So I want to share with you 1 John 5, 11 to 13, which says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not life, does not have life. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. This is a good verse for assurance of salvation when Satan comes and lies at you and says, you're not really saved. Look what you did. Okay, the word of God says, God has given you eternal life. He's not uh, uh, someone who gives you something and snatches it back, okay? He gives it to you, and he gives it to you not for just now, but eternity. And he says, how do you get this eternal life? The life is in Jesus. He does that does not have Jesus, he doesn't have life. And he who does have Jesus has life. The cho choice is simple. Choose Jesus, choose life, reject Jesus, choose death. If you choose Jesus Christ, you choose uh, eternal life in heaven with him forever and ever and ever. If you do not choose Jesus, you too will have eternal life, but it will be eternal damnation in the lake of fire. The choice is up to you. Ask the Lord to save you. He will save you. He loves you. He's ready to do it. Jesus already paid it all. All you have to do is ask him to forgive you for your sins. Ask him to come into your heart, make you the person that he would have you to be and believe that he did it and it's done. So in closing, I have a word of admonishment and encouragement to all of us today. You know what it is. Love our God. Trust our God. Worship and serve him and run the race with purpose. God bless you.